So I'm Adrian Borsa. I'm at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I'm proud to say I'm a double alum. Um, two areas which uh, could probably not be further apart. One is Scripps, and one is the uh, School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. So very different careers. But I'm here to talk to you about the second one. I'm actually here to, to, to talk about the drought, not to uh, harangue you about overwatering your lawns, but to provide you sort of perspective from a geophysicist um, whose job is to research crustal deformation from plate tectonics and earthquakes. So seemingly as far away from drought and water as you can get. I want to motivate this with sort of starting with these two images, which are really iconic ones from the drought. On the left is Folsom Lake in the summer of 2011. The lake is almost full. This was after a fairly wet year. And on the right, two and a half years later, sort of in the throes of this, this spectacular drought that, that we're having here in California. This is January 2014. You can see that the reservoir is almost empty. Now, to put this in context, Folsom Lake is actually a very important component of California's water storage and distribution system. This system is designed to capture water from the rainy north and distribute it down to the parts south, which includes us here in Los Angeles, um, and also to store water for, for times of need. And in fact, the system has worked exactly as it was, was meant to and as it was designed to. The problem is we're reaching the end of three years of drought. We may have another, and the system is stressed to capacity. So um, if you saw my title, it was um, when the rains fail, the, the mountains rise. So what does all this have to do with mountains rising? And in order to, to sort of steer you in that direction, I want to introduce uh, a bit of technology. This is uh, the global positioning system. And Essentially, this station right here, which is right next to Folsom Lake, uh, as shown by that star, is pretty much what you have in your phones, um, sort of research grade, but it's the same type of thing. And these stations are designed to measure millimeter scale motions of Earth's crust, which is stupendous in terms of sort of knowing what's going, around, going on. Um, this wasn't available even a decade ago, really, the way that it is now. Um, and, and what you see with a station like this, and this is the only time series I'll, I'll present today, um, it's a little bit cut off here, but uh, what you have on the horizontal axis is years from time, from 2005 to 2015, so about a decade. Um, and in gray are the actual station positions of this antenna here next to Folsom Lake. And, and what you see primarily is a seasonal signal, and that's shown in black, which when you remove that, resolves to this red time series. And this is showing us sort of long-term crustal changes. The, the vertical scale is um, sort of vertical motion in millimeters, so minus 20 to plus 20. And what we're seeing here, back in July 2011, this station was at about minus five millimeters relative to its long-term uh, uh, average. And then here, with the lake mostly empty, is up to about plus 10. So about a centimeter and a half of motion. And you know, the question is, you know, what do we tie this particular thing to? So this is where we'll, we'll just turn to a slight bit of physics here. The Earth on short time scales responds like a, like a rubber block. It's, you know, if you press down on a rubber block with your finger, the surface will depress. And if you release that pressure, the surface rebounds. And that's exactly what happens to Earth's surface when you put a, a load on it. So if you have a water load, it might be snow in the Sierras or water in Lake Folsom or water elsewhere, uh, groundwater. All these things put a, put a load on Earth's crust. In times of drought, that, this water evaporates or eventually disappears, and the crust rebounds. And that's exactly what you're seeing at all these GPS stations. What you really want, I mean, I showed you one GPS station. What you really want is a whole network of them to be able to tell where all these water loads are and where they're changing. And it turns out... There is such a network. Uh, this is a picture of North America, and on it, every station here, every, every dot is a GPS station that was built by the National Science Foundation to do something completely different. This was to track crustal deformation due to plate tectonics. And luckily, most of the plate tectonic action that's happening in the United States is right here in California, which, as you well know, is very useful for the drought. So, so here is... Um, <laughs> a blow up of, of these stations in California. And you know, if you look down in, in Los Angeles, you see this huge concentration of stations here. I'm not saying anything, but uh, um, we do have your back. Um, 
And, and what I'm going to show you is one station in particular. Now, I spent hours going through all the photos of every station, and I can tell you categorically that station P298 is the most photogenic station in the entire network. Um, so this is here in the California foothills. It's a very bucolic setting. This is the GPS antenna. And if you lift off that dome, there's something that looks quite a bit like a UFO. Um, it's attached to the cable back here. There's power, there's communications, there's a data logger back here. But the most important and the most expensive part of this station is what you can't see. So underground, the station is actually anchored at depth to, 20, so I think, 35 feet using steel, stainless steel um, tubing that's, that's sunk very deep, that's completely decoupled from the top, the, the top surface. So anything that's going on in the soil doesn't show up at the station. This is an exquisite instrument in terms of measuring tiny, tiny motions. And what you get when you put all these together, I'm going to show you now. So these are all the stations in the western US. And we're looking at panels from March 2011 through 2014, just stepping through. And, and I'll give you an idea. The color scale here is vertical displacement. Everything that's in blue is subsidence. And it's blue because I'm, I'm sort of relating to a water load that's pushing down the crust. And then uplift is the sort of reds and yellows, oranges, that you know, is meant to ev evoke so sort of this drying out. And, and what you see in 2011, this again was right after a very wet year, is throughout the western US, but particularly here in California, the crust has subsided by about five millimeters. So not much, but it's a coherent signal. So that's how we know it's not just noise or some air. 2012, not a lot going on. 2013, the Pacific Northwest actually had quite a bit of water. And you can see substance there, while the rest of the West was beginning to dry out and uplift. By 2014, it's essentially uplift everywhere you go. And this is fully in, the, in um, this drought period. I can tell you, if you look at the 2015 March picture, there's red pretty much everywhere. So we've got this system where all of a sudden, we've, we've taken a a network that was built for something entirely different and are using it for a very important and actually practical uh, use in another area. What you can do with this network now, and, and some pretty crazy math, um, is to now calculate what is the water load that you would need to be able to reproduce sort of any of these scenes. And it, doing so, you find out the first thing, which is really actually, for, for me, was quite remarkable, the most of the water loss is actually in the mountains. So we're losing, in the middle of the Sierras, more than half a meter of water everywhere. It's gone. It's disappeared. And there's not a lot of lakes up there in the Sierras. So this is primarily snowpack. It's vegetation moisture. It's, it's soil moisture. And this is what actually recharges the reservoirs. So it's a pretty grim situation up here in, in, the, in the Sierras. It's also the case elsewhere. If you go here, this is the Wasatch Front in Utah. Similarly dry, Cascadia. So wherever you look, the mountains are drying out. And here from, from a geophysicist standpoint, I mean, this is fascinating. The mountains are drying out, and the crust is lifting up. I'll tell you that my hydrologist colleagues, for them, it's not just a matter of curiosity. For them, it's a complete shift in a paradigm. The paradigm is sort of how they do their work and their research. Because we can now produce on a daily basis, and at much higher resolution than this, and in near real time, a picture of where water is, how it's changing, how the whole hydrological system is changing, not just for drought, but I mean, we're going to get potentially a big El Nino coming through, and then all of a sudden a lot of water. And we need to know where that water is and where it's stored. So this has really changed things, or is about to change things. And again, completely serendipitous, one area of science working to help another. So to conclude, I, I do want to say that, that when I was presenting this, I had a lot of questions asking, well, how much water is it? And I, I struggled quite a bit trying to get the exact sort of a number that would be evocative. And, and I went through these various, so I started with 240 gigatons of water. And okay, unless you're dealing with polar ice cap melting, you don't know what this means. But that's 240 kilometers cubed, which, okay, maybe that works in Europe. 56 miles cubed. Now, to me, that's very evocative. I mean, think about a mile above you, this huge cube of water, just one of them, and then 56. Okay, that's a lot of water. 10 centimeter sort of uniform layer over the western US. None of this really was resonating with the people I was talking to. It, it turns out that what I needed to do was to put it into terms of gallons, 63 trillion gallons. <laughs> and wow, that actually gets a response. So 
from, you know, the, the, the lesson for a scientist is when you're talking about drought and you want to make an impact, uh, you really need to know your audience. So thank you very much.